31 years have passed since the beginning of this case, but no one was prepared for the turn of events. A 16-year-old girl, who lived in the same house with her parents and younger sisters, went to sleep in her room and was found dead in the morning. The police immediately realized it was a murder, but the girl's relatives heard nothing that night. Fawn Cox was born in Kansas City, Missouri on March 24, 1973. Her parents soon had two other daughters. The family lived in a small two-story house in a poor bedroom community. From an early age, she helped her parents care for the younger children, attended church regularly, and had a passion for swimming. When she turned 16, Fawn got a part-time job at a local amusement park. Her family lived quite poorly, and the girl tried to earn some money in her spare time. She spent most of the summer vacation of 1989 working. Mostly, the girl stood behind the cash register and sold tickets for the rides. On Wednesday, July 26, she finished her shift. Around 10 p.m., her mother and younger sister picked her up by car, as it would have taken a long time to get home from the park by public transportation. Almost immediately after returning home, Fawn went to bed because she had to go back to work the next morning. The girl slept on the second floor, she had a separate room, the next room was usually where her sisters slept, but that night she was alone on the floor. Her sister Amber, only a year younger, was babysitting for a family she knew that night. Her other sister, Felicia, decided to sleep on the first floor because it was much cooler there. It was a very hot night and the only air conditioner that worked was downstairs. Her parents also slept on the first floor. The next morning, around 9 a.m., the whole family woke up to the sound of the alarm clock in Fawn's room, but for some reason, the girl did not turn it off. Her sister and mother went to her room, where an eerie sight awaited them. Fawn was lying on the bed, showing no signs of life, and there were visible bruises on the back of her neck. The girl also did not have a pulse, and her parents immediately called for an ambulance, but they were unable to do anything to help her. It was obvious that Fawn had died several hours earlier. After examining her body, medical experts determined that the cause of death was strangulation. The girl had also been subjected to violence. The police realized that they were facing a very difficult investigation from the very first hours. Her parents and sister had heard absolutely nothing, even though Fawn had been killed in her room in a small house with very poor soundproofing. But there was an explanation. The air conditioner on the first floor was old and working very loudly, blocking out all other noise in the house. The only oddity that night was noticed by Fawn's sister. Their dog was acting anxious and barking, but they didn't pay much attention. This behavior was attributed to the fact that the dog was pregnant. Police made several important discoveries after investigating the crime scene. Their theory is that the assailants, or a group of assailants, entered the house through a second-story window with a view of the backyard. An old trailer was parked in front of the house. It could easily have been used to climb up to the outbuilding's visor, which was almost level with the window. The window itself was left open. In Fawn's room, experts found the first important clues some short hairs, small bloodstains and semen on her bedsheet. All of this was sent to the lab for analysis. Several items, including radios, a Nintendo game console and a stereo recorder, were also missing from the house. Several other items were found on the ground in front of the house. It looked as if the burglar had thrown them out of the window to take them, but for some reason left them there. The detectives also discovered that a number of items had been taken from a closet in a room next door on the second floor. They believe the killer hid in this cupboard and waited until everyone in the house fell asleep. The Fawn sisters usually slept in that room, but not that night. That's why no one noticed the missing items. The police found another strange piece of evidence an old army cap was found in Fawn's room. All of Fawn's relatives said they had never seen this item on the girl. So detectives thought the killer might have left the cap at the scene. The police were unable to reach the suspects quickly, despite the impressive amount of evidence. The problem is that in 1989, DNA forensics was still relatively undeveloped, and there were no common genetic databases in existence at the time. The main version of events was presented by Detective Benjamin Caldwell, who was in charge of the case. In his opinion, there could have been more than one attacker, and they must have known the house well. 
Not only would they have known how to get to the second floor through the backyard in pitch darkness, but they would also have known the layout of the rooms. Looking for witnesses was the next step for the police. They interviewed Fon's neighbors, friends, and relatives, but all were inconclusive. The detectives had a serious problem ahead the neighborhood where the house was located was very poor and criminal. There were several criminal gangs operating in the area, it was difficult to bring their members to justice. A month after Fon's murder, the case is finally moving forward. A certain witness came forward to the police and led them to three suspects. This witness knew some important details that the police never released, so his story was taken seriously. The suspects turned out to be three teenagers, one of whom was in Fon's class. They were arrested and questioned, but the boys denied involvement in the murder. When the police searched the home of one of the boys, they found items stolen from the victim's room. This was enough to charge all three with murder. But again, the detectives were disappointed. First, the witness suddenly recanted and stopped cooperating with the police. Second, the analysis of DNA, hair, blood, and semen found at the crime scene did not show a clear match with the suspect's samples. At the time, experts had not yet been able to establish an exact match between the samples, and all of the tests produced controversial results. In other words, the analysis could not confirm either a complete match or a guaranteed mismatch. However, the police managed to get some useful information from one of the detainees. In one of the interrogations, he admitted that he and some other guys had indeed broken into Fon's house that night and stolen some things. He described how he made his way to the second floor through the overhanging roof and even revealed unknown details. According to him, when he threw a tape recorder out the window, the handle fell off. He hid it under a nearby bush, and the police did indeed find it there. But the young man quickly recanted and did not cooperate with the investigation, so his confession could not be used in court. Because of all this, the police had to let the men go and the investigation was once again at a standstill. Most likely, the witnesses were intimidated, but without their testimony in court, the case had almost no chance. All that is known is that one of them spent eight months in jail for stealing items from Fon's house. The case has languished ever since. Police did not reopen the investigation until the early 1990s, and the first thing they did was upload DNA samples from the crime scene into the Cody's database. It had been created several years earlier and contained DNA samples from people with criminal records. Unfortunately, no matches were found for Fon's killer. The creation of this database was the result of a major scientific advance in the study of DNA. It also allowed police to collect DNA samples from the three original suspects again and conduct more advanced testing. This time, experts determined conclusively that the hair, semen, and blood did not belong to any of them. This was odd, considering that the suspects were found in possession of Fom's belongings. Detectives speculated that the three men had indeed robbed her house that night, but there was another man with them. He was the one who had abused and killed the girl. This raised even more questions could four criminals have entered the house unnoticed, killed Fawn, and left the scene unnoticed? The police still had no answer to this question. Since then, the case has once again come to a standstill. With each passing year, the Fawn family believed less and less that this murder would ever be solved. They continued to believe that the three suspects were in their home that night and could point to the killer, but they never would. The only thing that could help them discover the truth was the DNA sample stored in the police lab. In 2018, Amber, Fon's younger sister, shared some disturbing details about the crime. She posted her thoughts and facts, unknown to the police, on a popular American forum dedicated to unsolved crimes. In its 23 years of existence, the forum has developed a very trustworthy reputation and its members have helped the police solve several high-profile cases. Amber has been verified and confirmed that she is indeed who she says she is, so her message has merit. In her opinion, the perpetrators broke into the house as Fawn's mother and her youngest daughter went to pick her up from her place of work. Their father, who was at home at the time, was asleep. The perpetrators then hid in a closet in an empty room on the second floor and waited for everyone to fall asleep. Amber also said that at least two of the perpetrators were personally acquainted with Fawn one of them studied with her but the second met the girl in church a few days before the murder. 
Amber was present at the moment of their meeting, and she was sure that the guy was interested in her sister romantically. She further concluded that the perpetrators had originally planned to kill Fawn, and the robbery was just a contributing factor. The police stuck to the version that the criminals broke into the house for profit and saw the sleeping girl and decided to subject her to violence. But why was Amber so sure that they were preparing to kill? She said it didn't make sense to rob their home. The family was poor and had nothing of value. But even more interesting was the following fact Amber said that the criminals used her younger sister's nightgown to strangle Fawn, which was lying in the next room. This meant that the attackers had taken it from that room beforehand and were hiding in the closet to strangle the victim. If they hadn't planned the murder beforehand and stumbled upon Fawn during the robbery, it wouldn't make sense for them to take the nightgown from the next room. Amber added that the perpetrators would also have had to know the family's routines to sneak into the house undetected. She herself worked part-time as a nanny Monday through Friday and was only home during the day. On weekends, she slept in the same second floor room through which the burglars entered. The burglars would have been spotted immediately. They also had to watch the house and wait for the moment when Fawn's mother and younger sister would pick the girl up from work. Despite all this, Amber's story didn't get any closer to solving the case. But it's 2018, and the science of DNA research has taken a leap forward. Dozens, if not hundreds, of long-forgotten cases have been solved thanks to new analytical tools. Fawn's relatives saw all this and resented why the police were in no hurry to reopen the murder investigation. They kept talking to detectives about the case, and each time they got the same answer extensive testing of DNA samples costs money, and the police have dozens of such cases. So the relatives had to wait for their turn and for the money to come through. But they decided to take the initiative and started a fundraising campaign in 2019. The family wanted to fully cover the cost of the DNA samples and also offered a $10,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest of the perpetrator. Due to the fact that the case was actively covered in the media and the relatives gave numerous interviews, many concerned people responded to the requests for help. The family quickly raised the necessary amount of money, but even here they were disappointed the police department refused to initiate an investigation at the expense of the victim's relatives. The chief detective explained that in such a situation there is bound to be a big problem if the relatives of a victim can pay for such tests and speed up the results then the same right should be available to hundreds of other families who have been searching for years for those responsible for the murder of their loved ones. And it is simply impossible to realize such a thing in practice, because only a few laboratories in the world perform innovative DNA tests, and with such a simultaneous influx of those who want to do so, their resources are simply not enough. The leading company in this field is Parabon Nanolabs. They have made tremendous strides in the study of DNA from finding a person's relatives through the smallest genetic samples to creating an approximate portrait of the owner of the DNA. It was this lab that would study the samples left in Fawn's bedroom on the night of her murder. The girl's relatives felt that the police were in no hurry to pursue their case. Another reason was that they were a poor family from a bad neighborhood, and murders there were not a priority for investigators. In an interview, Sister Fawn said that if it had been a matter of killing family members of the rich or dignitaries, all the necessary research would have been done immediately. Unfortunately, they were never able to speed up the process, and it wasn't until the end of 2020 that the long-awaited breakthrough came. But the family was not ready to hear the truth. With the financial support of the FBI, the police still sent samples from the Fawn room to the laboratory where they began a detailed study of the DNA and search for possible relatives of its owner. Mostly they worked with a sample of semen found at the crime scene. In November 2020, they finally managed to reach the person the DNA belonged to. It turned out to be Fawn's cousin, Donald Hawks. Naturally, the news shocked the entire family. At the time of Fawn's death, Donald was 21 years old, and no one had even considered his possible involvement. At the same time, Donald was quite a troubled man and was in and out of jail. He had been convicted of minor offenses such as theft and possession of illegal substances. Unfortunately, DNA samples were not taken from such criminals in those years, otherwise this case would have been solved much sooner. In 2006, Donald died of an overdose, 
but the police investigated his death because certain circumstances seemed suspicious. Because of this investigation, a sample of his DNA was saved, but it was not entered into the FBI database because the man in this case was the victim, not the perpetrator. As soon as the experts informed the police of their discovery, they compared the sample to the semen found at the crime scene and got a 100% match. Despite the gravity of this discovery, Fon's relatives had the answer to the question that had haunted them for 31 years. But there was one very important point left in the whole story. A great deal of evidence pointed to the fact that the three original suspects were also at Fon's house that night. Now it became clear how the perpetrators knew the house and the family's routine so well. Donald was a frequent guest at their house and knew all these nuances. However, the police closed the case and no new charges were filed against the three men. Sister Fawn explained that there was no point in beating a confession out of them. Even though these men were in the house that night, they may not have even witnessed the murder itself. Donald could very well have stayed in the house alone and only attacked Fawn afterwards. Felicia added that the three suspects had already paid for their crime during the time the case remained unsolved, the entire neighborhood was 100% sure of their guilt. Because of this, there was an extremely negative attitude toward them, with all the consequences that entailed. According to Fawn's sister, her life was effectively destroyed. In addition, after the case was closed, it was revealed that the police initially learned about the suspects from the family of one of them. The relatives noticed a Nintendo console among his belongings and remembered that it was the one that had been stolen from Fawn's house. It was mentioned on the news, and everyone in the neighborhood already knew the details. In any case, it is simply impossible to prove her guilt, and the victim's relatives finally know the name of the killer. He lived for 17 years without any punishment for what he had done, and all this time he socialized with his family as if nothing had happened. But eventually his addiction to illegal substances drove him to his grave and he was no longer a threat to anyone. Share your thoughts on this story in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like the video if you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.